The Secret History by Donna Tart. Prologue The snow in the mountains was melting, and Bunny had been dead for several weeks before we came to understand the gravity of our situation. He'd been dead for ten days before they found him, you know. It was one of the biggest manhunts in Vermont history. State troopers, the FBI, even an army helicopter. The college closed. The dye factory in Hampton shut down. People coming from New Hampshire, upstate New York, as far away as Boston. It is difficult to believe that Henry's modest plan could have worked so well despite these unforeseen events. We had it intended to hide the body where it couldn't be found. In fact, we hadn't hidden it at all but had simply left it where it fell in hopes that some luckless passerby would stumble over it before anyone else even noticed he was missing. This was a tale that told itself simply and well. The loose rocks, the body at the bottom of the ravine with a clean break at the neck, and the muddy skin marks of dug-in heels pointing the way down. A hiking accident. No more, no less. And it might have been left at that, at quiet tears in a small funeral, had it not been for the snow that fell that night. It covered him without a trace, and ten days later, when the thaw finally came, the state troopers and the FBI and the searchers from the town all saw that they had been walking back and forth over his body until the snow above it was packed down like ice. It is difficult to believe that such an uproar took place over an act for which I was partially responsible. Even more difficult to believe that I could have walked through it. The cameras, the uniforms, the black crowds sprinkled over Mount Cataract like ants in a sugar bowl without incurring a blink of suspicion. But walking through it all was one thing. Walking away, unfortunately, has proved to be quite another. And though once I thought I had left that ravine forever on an April afternoon long ago, now I am not so sure. Now the searchers have departed, and life has grown quiet around me. I have come to realize that while for years I might have imagined myself to be somewhere else, in reality, I have been there all the time, up at the top by the muddy wheel ruts in the new grass, where the sky is dark over the shivering apple blossoms and the first chill of the snow that will fall that night is already in the air. What are you doing up here? said Bunny, surprised, when he found the four of us waiting for him. Why, looking for the new ferns, said Henry. And after we stood whispering in the underbrush, one last look at the body and a last look around. No dropped keys. Lost glasses. Everybody got everything? And then started single file through the woods. I took one glance back through the saplings that leapt to close the path behind me. Though I remember the walk back and the first lonely flakes of snow that came drifting through the pines. Remember piling gratefully into the car and starting down the road like a family on vacation with Henry driving clenched jaw through the potholes and the rest of us leaning over the seats and talking like children. Though I remember only too well the long, terrible nights that lay ahead and the long, terrible days and nights that followed, I have only to glance over my shoulder for all those years to drop away and I see it behind me again. The ravine, rising all green and black through the saplings, a picture that will never leave me. I suppose that one time in my life I might have had any number of stories, but now there is no other. This is the only story I will ever be able to tell. Chapter 1 There's such a thing as the fatal flaw, that showy dark crack running down the middle of a life exist outside literature. I used to think it didn't. Now I think it does, and I think that mine is this, a morbid longing for the picturesque at all costs. Ah, moi, l'histoire d'un de mes folies. My name is Richard Pappin. I am 28 years old, and I had never seen New England or Hampton College until I was 19. I'm a Californian by birth, and also, I have recently discovered, by nature. The last is something I admit only now, after the fact. 
Not that it matters. I grew up in Piano, a small silicon village in the north. No sisters, no brothers. My father ran a gas station, and my mother stayed at home until I got older, and times got tighter, and she went to work, answering phones at the office of one of the big chip factories outside San Jose. Piano. The word conjures up drive-ins, tracked homes, waves of heat rising from the blacktop. My years there created for me an expendable past, disposable as a plastic cup, which I suppose was a very great gift, in a way. On leaving home, I was able to fabricate a new and far more satisfying history, full of striking, simplistic, environmental influences, a colorful past, easily accessible to strangers. The dazzle of this fictive childhood, full of swimming pools and orange groves and dissolute, charming showbiz parents, has all but eclipsed the drab original. In fact, when I think about my real childhood, I'm unable to recall much about it at all, except the sad jumble of objects, the sneakers I wore year-round, coloring books and comics from the supermarket, little of interest, less of beauty. I was quiet, tall for my age, prone to freckles. I didn't have many friends, but whether this was due to choice or circumstance, I do not now know. I did well in school, it seems, but not exceptionally well. I liked to read, Tom Swift, the token books, but also to watch television, which I did plenty of, lying on the carpets of our empty living room in the dull, long afternoons after school. I honestly can't remember much else about those years except a certain mood that permeated most of them, a melancholy feeling that associates with watching the wonderful world of Disney on Sunday nights. Sunday was a sad day. Early to bed, school the next morning. I was constantly worried my homework was wrong. But as I watched the fireworks go off in the night sky, over the floodlit castles of Disneyland, I was consumed by a more general sense of dread, of imprisonment within the dreary round of school and home. Circumstances which, to me at least, presented some empirical arguments for gloom. My father was mean, and our house ugly, and my mother didn't pay much attention to me. My clothes were cheap and my haircuts too short, and no one at school seemed to like me that much. And since all this had been true for as long as I could remember, I felt things would doubtless continue in this depressing vein as far as I could foresee. In short, I felt my existence was tainted in some subtle but essential way. I suppose it's not odd, then, that I have trouble reconciling my life to those of my friends, or at least to their lives as I perceive them to be. Charles and Camilla are orphans. How I longed to be an orphan when I was a child, reared by grandmothers and great aunts in a house in Virginia. A childhood I like to think about, with horses and rivers and sweet gum trees. And Francis. His mother, when she had him, was only seventeen. A thin-blooded, capricious girl with red hair and a rich daddy who ran off with a drummer for Vance Vane and his musical swains. She was home in three weeks, and the marriage was annulled in six. And, as Francis is fond of saying, the grandparents brought them up like brother and sister, him and his mother, brought them up in such a magnanimous style that even the gossips were impressed. English nannies in private schools, summers in Switzerland. Winters in France. Consider it even bluff old bunny, if you would. Not a childhood of reefer coats and dancing lessons, any more than mine was. But an American childhood. Sons of Clemson football star turned banker. Four brothers, no sisters, in a big noisy house in the suburbs, with sailboats and tennis rackets and golden retrievers. Summers on Cape Cod boarding schools near Boston and tailgates picnics during football season, an upbringing vitally present in Bunny in every respect, from the way he shook your hand to the way he told the joke. I do not now, nor did I ever, have anything in common with any of them. Nothing except a knowledge of Greek in the year of my life I spent in their company. And if love is a thing hailed in common, I suppose we had that in common, too. 
though I realize that might sound odd in light of the story I am about to tell. How to begin. After high school, I went to a small college in my hometown. My parents were opposed, as they had been made very plain that I was expected to help my father run his business, one of the many reasons I was in such an agony to escape. And, during my two years there, I studied ancient Greek. This was due to no love for the language, but because I was majoring in pre-med. Money, you see, was the only way to improve my fortunes. Doctors made a lot of money, quod erat demonstratum, and my counselor had suggested I take a language to fulfill the humanities requirement. And, since the Greek classes happened to meet in the afternoon, I took Greeks so I could sleep late on Mondays. It was an entirely random decision which, as you will see, turned out to be quite faithful. I did well in Greek, excelled in it, and I even won an award from the classics department in my last year. It was my favorite class because it was the only one held in a regular classroom. No jars of cow hearts, no smell of formanahide, no cages full of screaming monkeys. Initially, I thought with hard work I could overcome a fundamental squeamishness and distaste for my subject. That perhaps with even harder work, I could simulate something like a talent for it. But this was not the case. As the months went by, I remained uninterested if not downright sickened by my study of biology. My grades were poor. I was held in contempt by teacher and classmate alike. In what seemed even to me a doomed and ferric gesture, I switched to English literature without telling my parents. I felt that I was cutting my own throats by this, that I would certainly be very sorry, being still convinced that it was better to fail in a lucrative field than to thrive in one that my father, who knew nothing of either finance or academia, had assured me was most unprofitable. One which would inevitably result in my hanging around the house for the rest of my life, asking him for money. Money which, he assured me forcefully, he had no intention of giving me. So I studied literature and liked it better. But I didn't like home any better. I don't think I can explain the despair of my surroundings inspired in me. Though I now suspect, given the circumstances in my disposition, I would have been unhappy anywhere, in Biarritz or Caracas or the Isle of Capri. I was then convinced that my unhappiness was indigenous to that place. Perhaps a part of it was. While to a certain extent Milton is right, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven or of hell and so forth. It is nevertheless clear that piano was modeled less on paradise than that other, more Doralis city. In high school, I developed the habit of wandering through shopping malls after school, swaying through the bright, chill mezzanines until I was so dazed with consumer goods and product clothes, with promenades and escalators, with mirrors and muzak and noise and light that a fuse would blow in my brain and all at once everything would become unintelligible. Color without form, a babble of detached molecules. Then I would walk like a zombie to the parking lot and drive to the baseball field, where I wouldn't even get out of the car, just sit with my hands on the steering wheel and stare at the cyclone fence and the yellowed winter grass until the sun went down and it was too dark for me to see. Though I had a confused idea that my dissatisfaction was bohemian, vaguely Marxist in origin, when I was a teenager I made a fatuous show of socialism, mainly to irritate my father, I really couldn't begin to understand it. And I would have been angry if someone had suggested that it was due to a strong Puritan streak in my nature, which was in fact the case. Not long ago I found this passage in an old notebook, written when I was 18 or so. There is to me about this place a smell of rot, the smell of rot that ripe fruit makes. Nowhere, ever, have the hideous mechanics of birth and copulation and death, those monstrous upheavals of life that the Greeks call miasma, defilement, been so brutal or been painted up to look so pretty. Have so many people put so much faith in lies and mutability and death, death, death. 
This, I think, is pretty rough stuff. From the sound of it, had I stayed in California, I might have ended up in a cult, or at the very least practicing some weird dietary restriction. I remember reading about Pythagoras around this time, and finding some of his ideas curiously appealing. Wearing white garments, for instance, or abstaining from foods which have a soul. But instead I wound up on the east coast. I lit on Hampton by a trick of fate. One night, during a long Thanksgiving holiday of rainy weather, canned cranberries, ball games droning from the television, I went to my room after a fight with my parents. I cannot remember this particular fight, only that we always fought about money in school, and was tearing through my closet trying to find my coat when out it flew, a brochure from Hampton College, Hampton, Vermont. It was two years old, this brochure. In high school, a lot of colleges had sent me things because I did well on my SATs, though unfortunately not well enough to warrant much in this way of scholarships, and this one I had kept in my geometry book throughout my senior year. I don't know why it was in my closet. I suppose I'd saved it because it was so pretty. Senior year. I had spent dozens of hours studying the photographs as though if I had stared at them long enough and longingly enough, I would, by some sort of osmosis, be transported into the clear, pure silence. Even now I remember those pictures, like pictures in the storybook one loved as a child. Radiant meadows, mountains vaporous in the trembling distance, leaves ankle deep on a gusty autumn road bonfires and fog in the valleys, cellos, dark window panes, snow. Hampton College, Hampton, Vermont, established 1895. This alone was a fact to cause wonder. Nothing I knew of in piano had been established much before 1962. Student body, 500. Coed, progressive, specializing in the liberal arts. Highly selective. Hampton, in providing a well-rounded course of study in the humanities, seeks not only to give students a rigorous background in the chosen field, but insight into all the disciplines of Western art, civilization, and thought. In doing so, we hope to provide the individual not only with facts, but with the raw materials of wisdom. Hampton College, Hampton, Vermont. Even the name had an austere Anglican cadence, to my ear at least, which yearned hopelessly for England and was dead to the sweet, dark rhythms of the little mission towns. For a long time I looked at a picture of the building they called Commons. It was suffused with a weak academic light, different from piano, different from anything I had ever known. A light that made me think of long hours in the dusty libraries, and old books, and silence. My mother knocked on the door, said my name. I didn't answer. I tore out the information form in the back of the brochure and started to fill it in. Name, John Richard Poppin. Address, 4487 Mimosa Court. Piano, California. Would you like to receive information on financial aid? Yes. And I mailed it the following morning. The following subsequent were an endless dreary battle of paperwork, full of stalemates, fought in trenches. My father refused to complete the financial aid papers. Finally, in desperation, I stole the tax returns from the glove compartment of his Toyota and did them myself. More waiting. Then a note from the Dean of Admissions. An interview was required and when could I fly to Vermont? I could not afford to fly to Vermont and I wrote and told him so. Another wait. Another letter. The college would reimburse me for my travel expenses if their scholarship offer was accepted. Meanwhile the financial aid packet had come in. 
My family's contribution was more than my father said he could afford, and he would not pay it. This sort of guerrilla warfare dragged on for eight months. Even today, I do not fully understand the chain of events that brought me to Hampton. Sympathetic professors wrote letters. Exceptions of various sorts were made in my case. In less than a year after I sat down on the gold shag carpets of my little room in piano and impulsively filled out the questionnaire, I was getting off the bus in Hampton with two suitcases and fifty dollars in my pocket. I had never been east of Santa Fe, never north of Portland, and when I stepped off the bus after a long, anxious night that had begun somewhere in Illinois, it was six o'clock in the morning, and the sun was rising over mountains and birches and impossibly green meadows. And to me, days with night and no sleep, and three days on the highway, it was like a country from a dream. The dormitories weren't even dorms or at any rate, not like the dorms I knew, with cinder block walls and depressing yellowish light, but white clapboard houses with green shutters, set back from the commons in groves of maple and ash. All the same, it never occurred to me that my particular room, whenever it might be, would be anything but ugly and disappointing, and it was something of a shock that I saw it for the first time. A white room with big north-facing windows, monkish and bare, with scarred oak floors in the ceiling slanted like a garret. On my first night there, I sat on the bed during the twilight while the walls went slowly from grey to gold to black, listening to a soprano's voice climbing dizzily up and down, somewhere at the other end of the hall, until at last the light was completely gone. And the faraway soprano spiraled on and on in the darkness like some angel of death, and I can't remember the air ever seeming as high and cold and rarefied as it was that night, or ever feeling farther away from the low-slung lines of dusty piano. Those first days before class started, I spent alone in my whitewashed room, in the bright meadows of Hampton. And I was happy in those first days, as really I'd never been before, roaming like a sleepwalker, stunned and drunk with beauty. A group of red-cheeked girls playing soccer, ponytails flying, their shouts and laughter carrying faintly over the velvety twilight field. Trees creaking with apples, falling apples red on the grass beneath. The heavy, sweet smell of apples rotting on the ground, and the steady thrumming of wasps around them. Coleman's clock tower ivied brick, white spire, spa-bound in the hazy distance. The shock of first seeing a birch tree at night, rising up in the dark as cool and slim as a ghost. In the nights, bigger than imagining, black and gusty and enormous, disordered and wild with stars. I was planning to sign up for Greek again, as it was the only language at which I was at all proficient. But when I told this to the academic counselor to whom I had been assigned, a French teacher named Georges Lafourgou, with olive skin and a pinched, long-nostrilled nose like a turtle's, he only smiled and pressed the tips of his fingers together. I am afraid there may be a problem, he said, in accented English. Why? There is only one teacher of ancient Greek here, and he is very particular about his students. I studied Greek for two years. That probably will not make any difference. Besides, if you are going to major in English literature, you will need a modern language. There is still space left in my elementary French class, and some room in German and Italian. The Spanish. He consulted his list. The Spanish classes are for the most part filled, but if you like, I will have a word with Mr. Delgato. Maybe you could speak to the Greek teacher instead. I don't know if it would do any good. He accepts only a limited number of students. A very limited number. Besides, in my opinion, he conducts the selection on a personal rather than academic basis. His voice bore a hint of sarcasm. 
also a suggestion that, if it was all the same to me, he would prefer not to continue this particular conversation. I don't know what you mean, I said. Actually, I thought I did know. La Fogu's answer surprised me. It's nothing like that, he said. Of course, he is a distinguished scholar. He happens to be quite charming as well. But he has what I think are some very odd ideas about teaching. He and his students have virtually no contact with the rest of the division. I don't know why they continue to list his course in the general catalogue. It's very misleading. Every year there is confusion about it. Because, practically speaking, the classes are closed. I am told that to study with him, one must have read the right things, or similar views. It has happened repeatedly that he has turned away students, such as yourself, who has done prior work in classics. With me, he lifted an eyebrow. If the student wants to learn what I teach and is qualified, I allow him in my classes. Very democratic, no? Is this the best way? Does that sort of thing happen often here? Of course, there are difficult teachers at every school, and plenty. To my surprise, he lowered his voice. And plenty here who are far more difficult than him. Though I must ask that you do not quote me on that. I won't, I said, a bit startled by this sudden confidential manner. Really, it is quite essential that you don't. He was leaning forward. Whispering, his tiny mouth scarcely moving as he spoke. I must insist, perhaps you are not aware of this, but I have several formidable enemies in the literature division. Even though you may scarcely believe it, here in my own department. Besides, he continued in a more normal tone. He is a special case. He has taught here for many years and even refuses payments for his work. Why? He is a wealthy man. He donates his salary to the college, though he accepts, I think, one dollar a year for tax purposes. Oh, I said. Even though I had been at Hampton only a few days, I was already accustomed to the official accounts of financial hardship, of limited endowment, of corners cut. Now me, said Lafogu, I like to teach well enough. But I have a wife and a daughter in school in France. The money comes in handy, yes. Maybe I'll talk to him anyway. Lafogu shrugged. You can try, but I advise you not to make an appointment, or probably he will not see you. His name is Hodia Morrow. I had not been particularly bent on taking Greek, but what Lafogu said intrigued me. I went downstairs and walked into the first office I saw. A thin, sour-looking woman with tired blonde hair was sitting at the desk in the front room, eating a sandwich. It's my lunch hour, she said. Come back at two. I'm sorry, I was just looking for a teacher's office. Well, I'm the registrar, not the switchboard, but I might know. Who is it? Julian Morrow. Oh, him, she said, surprised. What do you want with him? He's upstairs, I think, in the Lyceum. What room? Only teacher up there. Likes his peace and quiet. You'll find him. Actually, finding the Lyceum wasn't easy at all. It was a small building on the edge of campus, old and covered with ivy in such a manner as to be almost indistinguishable from its landscape. Downstairs were lecture halls and classrooms, all of them empty, with clean blackboards and freshly waxed floors. I wandered around helplessly until I finally noticed the staircase, small and badly lit, in the far corner of the building. Once at the top I found myself in a long, deserted hallway. Enjoying the noise of my shoes on the linoleum, I walked along briskly looking at the closed doors for numbers or names until I came to one that had a brass card holder and, within it, an engraved card that read Julian Morrow. I stood there for a moment and then I knocked, three short raps. A minute or so passed, 
and another, and then the white door opened just a crack. A face looked out at me. It was a small, wise face, as alert and poised as a question, and though certain features of it were suggestive of youth, the elfin upsweep of the eyebrows, the deft lines of nose and jaw and mouth, it was by no means a young face, and the hair was snow white. I stood there for a moment as he blinked at me. How may I help you? The voice was reasonable and kind, in a way that pleasant adults sometimes have with children. I, well, my name is Richard Poppin. He put his head to the side and blinked again, bright-eyed, amiable as a sparrow. And I want to take your class in ancient Greek. His face fell. Oh! I'm sorry. His tone of voice, incredibly enough, seemed to suggest that he really was sorry, sorrier than I was. I can't think of anything I like better, but I'm afraid there isn't any room. My class is already filled. Something about this apparently sincere regret gave me courage. Surely there must be some way, I said. One extra student. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Poppin, he said, almost as if he were consoling me on the death of a beloved one, tiring to make me understand that he was powerless to help me in any substantial way. But I have limited myself to five students, and I cannot even think of adding another. Five students is not very many. He shook his head quickly, eyes shut, as if entreaty were more than he could hear. Really, I'd love to have you, but I mustn't even consider it, he said. I'm terribly sorry. Will you excuse me now? I have a student with me. More than a week went by. I started my classes and got a job with a professor of psychology named Dr. Rowland. I was to assist him in some vague research, the nature of which I never discovered. He was an old, dazed, disordered-looking fellow, a behavioralist, who spent most of his time loitering in the teacher's lounge. And I made some friends, most of them freshmen who lived in my house. Friends is perhaps an inaccurate word to use. We ate our meals together, saw each other coming and going, but mainly were thrown together by the fact that none of them knew anybody, a situation which, at the time, did not seem necessarily unpleasant. Among the few people I had, Net, who'd been at Hampton a while, I asked what the story was with Julian Morrow. Nearly everyone had heard of him, and I was given all sorts of contradictory but fascinating information. That he was a brilliant man, that he was a fraud, that he had no college degree, that he had been a great intellectual in the forties, and a friend to Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, that his family money came from a partnership in a white shoe banking firm, or conversely, from the purchase of a foreclosed property during the Depression, that he had dodged a draft in some war, though chronologically this was difficult to compute, that he had ties with the Vatican, a deposed royal family in the Middle East, Franco's Spain. The degree of truth in any of this was, of course, unknowable, but the more I heard about him, the more interested I became and I began to watch for him and his little group of pupils around campus. Four boys and a girl. They were nothing so unusual at a distance. At close range, though, they were an arresting party, at least to me, who had never seen anything like him, and to whom they suggested a variety of picturesque and fictive qualities. Two of the boys wore glasses, curiously enough the same kind, tiny, old-fashioned, with round steel rims. The larger of the two, and he was quite large, well over six feet, was dark-haired, with square jaw and coarse, pale skin. He might have been handsome had his features been less set, or his eyes behind the glasses less expressionless and blank. He wore dark English suits and carried an umbrella, a bizarre sight in Hampton, and he walked stiffly through the throng of hippies and beatniks and preppies and punks with the self-conscious formality of an old ballerina, surprising in one so large as he. Henry Winter, said my friends when I pointed him out, 
at a distance, making a wide circle to avoid a group of bongo players on the lawn. The smaller of the two, but not by much, was a sloppy blonde boy, rosy-cheeked and gum-chewing, with a relentlessly cheery demeanor and his fists thrust deep in the pockets of his knee-sprung trousers. He wore the same jacket every day, a shapeless brown tweed that was frayed at the elbows and short in the sleeves, and his sandy hair was parted on the left, so a long forelock fell over one bespectacled eye. Bunny Kokorin was his name. Bunny being somehow short for Edmund. His voice was loud and honking and carried in the dining halls. The third boy was the most exotic of the set. Angular and elegant, he was precariously thin, with nervous hands and a shrewd albino face and a short fairy mop of the reddest hair I had ever seen. I thought, erroneously, that he dressed like Alfred Douglas or the Comte de Montesquieu. Beautiful starchy shirts with French cuffs, magnificent neckties, a black greatcoat that billowed behind him as he walked and made him look like a cross between the student's prince and Jack the Ripper. Once, to my delight, I even saw him wearing pince-nez. Later, I discovered that they weren't real pince-nez, but only had glass in them, and that his eyes were a good deal sharper than my own. Francis Albernathy was his name. For the inquiries elicited my suspicion from male acquaintances who wondered at my interest in such a person. And then there were a pair, boy and girl. I saw them together a great deal, and at first I thought they were boyfriend and girlfriend, until one day I saw them up close and realized they had to be siblings. Later I learned that they were twins. They looked very much alike, with heavy, dark blonde hair, and epicene faces as clear, a cheerful and grave as a couple of Flemish angels. And perhaps most unusual in the context of Hampton, where pseudo-intellects and teenage decadence abounded, and where black clothing was the regulier, they liked to wear pale clothes, particularly white. In this swarm of cigarettes and dark sophistication, they appeared here and there like figures from an allegory, or long-dead celebrants from some forgotten garden party. It was easy to figure out who they were, as they shared the distinction of being the only twins on campus. Their names were Charles and Camilla Macaulay. All of them, to me, seemed highly unapproachable, but I watched them with interest whenever I happened to see them. Francis, stooping to talk to a cat on the doorstep, Henry dashing past at a wheel of a little white car, with Julie in the passenger's seat. Bunny leaning out of an upstairs window to yell something at the twins on the lawn below. Slowly, more information came my way. Francis Albertany was from Boston and, from most accounts, quite wealthy. Henry, too, was said to be wealthy. What's more, he was a linguistic genius. He had spoken a number of languages, ancient and modern, and had published a translation of Anacreon with commentary when he was only 18. I found this out from Georges Lafargue, who was otherwise sour and reticent on the topic. Later, I discovered that Henry, during his freshman year, had embarrassed Lafargue badly in front of the entire literature for faculty during the question-and-answer period of his annual lecture on Racine. The twins had apartments off campus and were from somewhere down south. And Bunny Pukokoran had a habit of playing John Philip Sousa march tunes in his room, at full volume, late at night. Not to imply that I was overly preoccupied with any of this. I was settling in at school by this time. Classes had begun and I was busy with my work. My interest in Julian Morrow and his Greek pupils though still keen, was starting to wane when a curious coincidence happened. It happened the Wednesday morning of my second week, when I was in the library making some Xeroxes for Dr. Roland before my 11 o'clock class. After about 30 minutes, spots of light swimming in front of my eyes, I went back to the front desk to give the Xerox key to the librarian, and as I turned to leave I saw them, Bunny and the twins, sitting at a table that was spread with papers and pens and bottles of ink. 
The bottles of ink I remember particularly, because I was very charmed by them, and by the long black straight pens, which look incredibly archaic and troublesome. Charles was wearing a white tennis sweater, and Camilla a sundress with a sailor collar and a straw hat. Bunny's tweed jacket was slung across the back of his chair, exposing several large rips and stains in the lining. He was leaning his elbows on the table, hair and eyes, his rumpled shirt sleeves held up with stripped garters. Their heads were close together and they were talking quietly. I suddenly wanted to know what they were saying. I went to the bookshelf behind the table, the long way, as if I wasn't sure what I was looking for, all the way down until I was so close I could have reached out and touched Bunny's arm. My back to them, I picked up a book at random, a ridiculous sociological text, as it happened, and pretended to study the index. Secondary analysis, secondary deviance, secondary groups, secondary schools. I don't know about that, Camilla was saying. If the Greeks are sailing to Carthage, it should be accusative. Remember? Place J. Wither? That's the rule. Can't be. This was Bunny. His voice was nasal, garrulous. The B.C. feels with a bad case of a Long Island lockjaw. It's not place with her, it's place too. I put my money on the ablative case. It was a confused rattling of papers. Wait, said Charles. His voice was a lot like his sister's. Hoarse, slightly southern. Look at this. They're not just sailing to Carthage, they're sailing to attack it. You're crazy. No, they are. Look at the next sentence. We need a dative. Are you sure? More rustling of papers. Absolutely. Epi to Carchidona. I don't see how, said Bunny. He sounded like Thurston Howell on Gilligan's Island. Ablative is the ticket. The hard are always ablative. A slight pause. Bunny, said Charles, you're mixed up. Ablative is in Latin. Well, of course, I know that, said Bunny irritably, after a confused pause which seemed to indicate the contrary. But you know what I mean. Aorist, ablative, all the same thing, really. Look, Charles, said Camilla, this dative won't work. Yes, it will. They're sailing to attack, aren't they? Yes. But the Greeks sailed over the sea to Carthage. But put that epi in front of it. Well, we can attack and still use epi. We have to use an accusative because of the first rules. Segregation. Self. Self-concept. I looked down at the index and racked my brains for the case they were looking for. The Greeks sailed over the sea to Carthage. To Carthage. Place whither. Place whence. Carthage. Suddenly something occurred to me. I closed the book and put it on the shelf and turned around. Excuse me, I said. Immediately they stopped talking, startled, and turned to stare at me. I'm sorry, but would the locative case do? Nobody said anything for a moment. Locative? said Charles. Just add Z to Carchito, I said. I think it's Z. But if you use that, you will need a preposition, except the epi if they're going to war. It implies Carthage Ward, so you won't have to worry about a case either. Charles looked at his paper, then at me. Locative, he said. It's pretty obscure. Are you sure it exists for Carthage? said Camilla. I hadn't thought of this. Maybe not, I said. I know it does for Athens. Charles reached over and hauled the lexicon towards him over the table and began to leaf through it. Oh hell, don't bother, said Bunny stridently. If you don't have to decline it and doesn't need a proposition, it sounds good to me. He reared back in his chair and looked up at me. I'd like you to shake your hand, stranger. I offered it to him. He clasped and shook it firmly, almost knocking an ink bottle over with his elbow as he did so. Glad to meet you, yes, yes he said, reaching up with his other hand to brush the hair from his eyes. 
I was confused by this sudden glare of attention. It was as if the characters in a favorite painting, absorbed in their own concerns, had looked up out of the canvas and spoken to me. Only the day before Francis, in a switch of black cashmere and cigarette smoke, had brushed past me in the corridor. For a moment, as his arm touched mine, he was a creature of flesh and blood, but the next, he was a hallucination again, a figment of the imagination stalking down the hallway as heedless of me as ghosts, in their shadowy rounds, are said to be heedless of the living. Charles, still fumbling with the lexicon, rose and offered his hand. My name is Charles Macaulay. Richard Poppin. Oh, you're the one, said Camilla suddenly. What? You. You came by to ask about the Greek class. This is my sister, said Charles, and this is... Bun, did you tell him your name already? No, no, I don't think so. You've made me a happy man, sir. We had ten more like this to do, and five minutes to do them in. Edmund Kokoran's the name, said Bunny, grasping my hand again. How long have you studied Greek? said Camilla. Two years. You're rather good at it. Pity you are in our class, said Bunny. A restrained silence. Well, said Charles uncomfortably, Julian is funny about things like that. Go see him again, why don't you? Bunny said. Take him some flowers and tell him you love Plato and he'll be eating out of your hand. Another silence, this one more disagreeable than the first. Camilla smiled, not exactly at me, a sweet, unfocused smile, quite impersonal, as if I were a waiter or a clerk in a store. Beside her, Charles, who was still standing, smiled too and raised a polite eyebrow, a gesture which might have been nervous, might have meant anything, really but which I took to mean, is that all? I mumbled something and was about to turn away when Bunny, who was staring in the opposite direction, shot out an arm and grabbed me by the wrist. Wait, he said. Startled, I looked up. Henry had just come in the door, dark suit, umbrella, and all. When he got to the table, he pretended not to see me. Hello, he said to them. Are you finished? Bunny tossed his head at me. Look here, Henry. We got someone to meet you, he said. Henry glanced up. His expression did not change. He shut his eyes and then reopened them, as if he found it extraordinary that someone such as myself should stand in his path of vision. Yes, yes, said Bunny. This man's name is Richard. Richard what? Poppin. Yes, yes, Richard Poppin. Studies Greek. Henry brought his head up to look at me. Not here, surely, he said. No, I said, meeting his gaze, but a stare was so rude I was forced to cut my eyes away. Oh, Henry, look at this, would you? said Charles hastily, rustling through the papers again. We are going to use a dative or accusative here, but he suggested locative. Henry leaned over his shoulder and inspected the page. Hmm. Archaic locative, he said. Very Homeric. Of course, it would be grammatically correct, but perhaps a bit off contextually. He brought his head back up to scrutinize me. The light was at an angle that glinted off his tiny spectacles, and I couldn't see his eyes behind them. Very interesting. You're a Homeric scholar. I might have said yes, but I had the feeling he would be glad to catch me in a mistake and that he would be able to do it easily. I like Homer, I said weakly. He regarded me with chill distaste. I love Homer, he said. Of course, we're studying things rather more modern, Plato and the tragedians and so forth. I was trying to think of some response when he looked away in disinterest. We should go, he said. Charles shuffled his paper together stood up again. Camilla stood beside him and this time she offered me her hand, too. Side by side they were very much alike, in similarity less of lineament than of manner and bearing, a correspondence of gesture which bounced an echo between them so that a blink seemed to reverberate, 
moments later, in a twitch of the other's eyelid. Their eyes were the same color of gray, intelligent and calm. She, I thought, was very beautiful, in an unsettling, almost medieval way which should not be apparent to the casual observer. But he pushed his chair back and slapped me between the shoulder blades. Well, sir, he said, you must get together sometime and talk about Greek, yes? Goodbye, Henry said with a nod. Goodbye, I said. They strode off and I stood where I was and watched them go. Walking out of the library in a wide phalanx, side by side. When I went by Dr. Rowland's office a few minutes later to drop off the Xeroxes, I asked him if he could give me an advance on my work-study check. He leaned back in his chair and trained his watery, red-rimmed eyes on me. Well, you know, he said, for the past ten years I've made it my practice not to do that. Let me tell you why that is. I know, sir, I said hastily. Dr. Rowland's discourses on his practices could sometimes take half an hour or more. I understand. Only it's some kind of emergency. He leaned forward again and cleared his throat. And what, he said, might that be? His hands, folded on the desk before him, were gnarled with veins and had a bluish, purely sheen around the knuckles. I stared at them. I needed ten or twenty dollars. Needed it badly, but I had come in without first deciding what to say. I don't know, I said. Something has come up. He furled his eyebrows impressively. Dr. Roland's senile manner was said to be a facade. To me, it seemed quite genuine, but sometimes, when you were off your guard, you would display an unexpected flash of lucidity, which, though it frequently did not relate to the topic at hand, was evidence that rational processes rumbled somewhere in the muddy depths of his consciousness. It's my car, I said, suddenly inspired. I didn't have a car. I needed to get it fixed. I had not expected him to inquire further, but instead he perked up noticeably. What's the trouble? Something with a transmission. Is it dual-pathed, air-cooled? Air-cooled, I said, shifting to the other foot. I did not care for this conversational turn. I don't know a thing about cars and am hard-pressed to change a tire. What you got, one of those little V6 numbers? Yes. I'm not surprised. All the kids seem to crave them. I had no idea how to respond to this. He pulled out his desk drawer and began to pick things up and bring them close to his eyes and put them back in again. Once the transmission goes, he said, in my experience, the car is gone. Especially on a V6. You might as well take the vehicle to the junk heap. Now, myself, I've got a 90H Regency Brogham, 10 years old. With me, is regular checkups, new filter every 1500 miles, and new oil every 3000. Runs a dream. Watch out for those garages in town, he said sharply. Pardon? He found his checkbook at last. Well, you ought to go to the bursar, but I guess this'll be alright, he said, opening it and beginning to write laboriously. Some of these places in Hampton, they find out you're from the college, they'll charge you double. Redeemed repair is generally the best. There are a bunch of born-agains down there, but they'll still shake you down pretty good if you don't keep an eye on them. He tore out the check and handed it to me. I glanced at it and my heart skipped a beat. Two hundred dollars. He signed it and everything. Don't you let them charge you a penny more, he said. No, sir, I said, barely able to conceal my joy. What would I do with all this money? Maybe he would even forget he had given it to me. He pulled down his glasses and looked at me over the tops of them. That's redeemed repair, he said. They're out on Highway 6. The sign is shaped like a cross. Thank you, I said. I walked down the hall with spirits soaring and two hundred dollars in my pocket, and the first thing I did was to go downstairs to the payphone and call a cab to take me into Hampton Town. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's lying on my feet. It's sort of a gift I have. And what did I do in Hampton Town? Frankly, I was too staggered by my good fortune to do much of anything. It was a glorious day. I was sick of being poor. So, 
Before I thought of better of it, I went into an expensive men's shop on the square and bought a couple of shirts. Then I went down to the Salvation Army and poked around in bins for a while and found a Harris tweed overcoat and a pair of brown wingtips that fit me, and also some cufflinks and a funny old tie that had pictures of men hunting deer on it. And when I came out of the store, I was happy to find that I still had nearly a hundred dollars. Should I go to the bookstore? To the movies? Buy a bottle of scotch? In the end, I was so swarmed by the flock of possibilities that I drifted up, murmuring and smiling to crowd about me on the bright autumn sidewalk that, like a farm boy flustered by a bevy of prostitutes, I brushed right through them to the payphone on the corner to call a cab to take me to school. Once in my room, I spread the clothes on my bed. The cufflinks were beaten up and had someone else's initials on them, but they looked like real gold glinting in the drowsy autumn sun which poured through the window and soaked in the yellow pools on the oak floor, voluptuous, rich, intoxicating. I had a feeling of deja vu when, the next afternoon, Julian answered the door exactly as he had the first time, by opening it only a crack and looking through it warily, as if there were something wonderful in his office that needed guarding, something that he was careful not everyone should see. It was a feeling I would come to know well in the next months. Even now, years later and far away, sometimes in dreams I find myself standing before that white door, waiting for him to appear like the gatekeeper in a fairy story, ageless, watchful, sly as a child. When he saw it was me, he opened the door slightly wider than he had that first time. Mr. Pepin again, isn't it? he said. I didn't bother to correct him. I'm afraid so. He looked at me for a moment. You have a wonderful name, you know, he said. There were kings of France named Pepin. Are you busy now? I'm never too busy for an heir to the French throne, if that is in fact what you are, he said pleasantly. I'm afraid not. He laughed and quoted a little Greek epigram about honesty being a dangerous virtue, and, to my surprise, opened the door and ushered me in. It was a beautiful room, not an office at all, and much bigger than it looked from outside, airy and white, with a high ceiling and a breeze fluttering in the starched curtains. In the corner, Near a low bookshelf was a big round table littered with teapots and Greek books, and there were flowers everywhere, roses and carnations and anemones, on his desk, on the table, in the window sills. The roses were especially fragrant. Their smell hung rich and heavy in the air, mingled with the smell of bergamot and black china tea, and a faint inky scent of camphor. Breathing deep, I felt intoxicated. Everywhere I looked was something beautiful. Oriental rugs, porcelains, tiny paintings like jewels, a dazzle of fractured color that struck me as if I had stepped into one of those little Byzantine churches that are so plain on the outside. Inside, the most paradisal painted eggshell of gilt and tissere. He sat in an armchair by the window and motioned for me to sit too. I suppose you've come about the Greek class he said. Yes. His eyes were kind, frank, more gray than blue. It's rather late in the term, he said. I'd like to study it again. It seems a shame to drop it after two years. He arched his eyebrows, deep, mischievous, and looked at his folded hands for a moment. I'm told you're from California. Yes, I am, I said, rather startled. Who had told him that? I don't know many people from the West, he said. I don't know if I would like it there. He paused, looking pensive and vaguely troubled. And what do you do in California? I gave him the spiel. Orange groves, failed movie stars, lamp-lit cocktail hours by the swimming pool, cigarettes, and nui. He listened, his eyes fixed on mine, apparently entranced by these fraudulent recollections. Never have my efforts met with such attentiveness, such keen solicitude. 
He seemed so utterly enthralled that I was tempted to embroider a little more than perhaps was prudent. How thrilling, he said warmly when I, half euphoric, was finally played out. How very romantic. Well, we're all quite used to it out here, you know, I said, trying not to fidget, flushed with the brilliance of my success. And what does a person with such a romantic temperament seek in the study of the classics? He asked this as if, having had the good fortune to catch such a rare bird as myself, he was anxious to extract my opinion while I was still captive in his office. If by romantic you mean solitary and introspective, I said, I think romantics are frequently the best classicists. He laughed. The great romantics are often failed classicists. But that's beside the point, isn't it? What do you think of Hampton? Are you happy here? I provided an exegesis, not as brief as it might have been, of why at the moment I found the college satisfactory for my purposes. Young people often find the country a bore, said Julian. Which is not to say that it isn't good for them. Have you traveled much? Tell me what it was that attracted you to this place. I should think a young man such as yourself would be at a loss outside the city. But perhaps you feel tired of city life. Is that so? So skillfully and engagingly that I was quite disarmed, he led me deftly from topic to topic, and I was sure that in this talk, which seemed only a few minutes but was really much longer, he managed to extract everything about me he wanted to know. I did not suspect that his rapt interest might spring from anything less than the very richest enjoyment of my own company, and though I found myself talking with relish on a bewildering variety of topics, some of them quite personal, and with more frankness than was customary, I was convinced that I was acting of my own volition. I wish I could remember more of what was said that day. Actually, I do remember much of what was said, most of it too fatuous for me to recall with pleasure. The only point at which he deferred, aside from an incredulous eyebrow raised at my mention of Picasso. When I came to know him better, I realized that he must have thought this an almost personal affront was on the topic of psychology, which was, after all, heavy on my mind, working for Dr. Roland and everything. But do you really think, he said, concerned, that one can call psychology a science. Certainly. What else is it? But even Plato knew that class and conditioning and so forth have an inalterable effect on the individual. It seems to me that psychology is only another word for what the ancients called fate. Psychology is a terrible word. He agreed vigorously. Yes, it is terrible, isn't it? He said, but with an expression that indicated that he thought it rather tasteless of me even to use it. Perhaps in certain ways it is a helpful construct in talking about a certain kind of mind. The country people who live around me are fascinating because their lives are so closely bound to fate that they really are predestined. But, he laughed. I'm afraid my students are never very interesting to me because I always know exactly what they're going to do. I was charmed by his conversation, and despite its illusion of being rather modern and digressive. To me, the hallmark of the modern mind is that it loves to wander from its subject. I now see that he was leading me by circumlocution to the same points again and again. For if the modern mind is whimsical and discursive, the classical mind is narrow, unhesitating, relentless. It is not a quality of intelligence that one encounters frequently these days. But though I can digress with the best of them, I am nothing in my soul if not obsessive. We talked a while longer, and presently fell silent. After a moment, Julian said courteously, If you like, I'd be happy to take you as a pupil, Mr. Poppin. I, looking out the window and having half forgotten why I was there, turned to gape at him and couldn't think of a thing to say. However, 
before you accept, there are a few conditions to which you must agree. What? I said, suddenly alert. Will you go to the registrar's office tomorrow and put in a request to change counselors? He reached for a pen and a cup on his desk. Amazingly, it was full of Mont Blanc fountain pens, miser sticks, at least a dozen of them. Quickly, he wrote out a note and handed it to me. Don't lose it, he said, because the registrar never assigns me counselors unless I request them. The note was written in a masculine, rather 19th century hand, with Greek ease. The ink was still wet. But I have a counselor, I said. It is my policy never to accept a pupil unless I am his counselor as well. Other members of the literature faculty disagree with my teaching methods, and you will run into problems if someone else gains the power to veto my decisions. You should pick up some drop-ad forms as well. I think you are going to have to drop all the classes you are currently taking, except the French, which would be as well for you to keep. You appear to be deficient in the area of modern languages. I was astonished. I can't drop all my classes. Why not? Registration's over. That doesn't matter at all, said Julian serenely. The classes that I want you to pick up will be with me. You will probably be taking three or four classes with me per term for the rest of your time here. I looked at him. No wonder he had only five students. But how can I do that? I said. He laughed. I'm afraid you haven't been to Hampton very long. The administration doesn't like it much, but there's nothing they can do. Occasionally they try to raise problems with distribution requirements, but that's never caused any real trouble. We study art, history, philosophy, all sorts of things. If I find you're deficient in a given area, I may decide to give you a tutorial, perhaps refer you to another teacher. As French is not my first language, I think it wise if you continue to study that with Mr. Lafargu. Next year, I'll start you in Latin. It's a difficult language, but knowing Greek will make it easier for you. The most satisfying of languages, Latin. You will find it's a delight to learn. I listened, a bit affronted by his tone. To do what he asked was tantamount to my transferring entirely out of Hampton College into his own little academy of ancient Greek, student body five, six including me. All my classes with you? I asked. Not quite all of them, he said seriously, and then laughed when he saw the look on my face. I believe that having a great diversity of teachers is harmful and confusing for a young mind. In the same way, I believe that it is better to know one book intimately than a hundred superficially, he said. I know the modern world tends to not agree with me, but after all, Plato had only one teacher, and Alexander. Slowly I nodded, trying as I did so to think of a tactful way to withdraw, when my eyes met his and suddenly I thought, why not? I was slightly giddy with the force of his personality, but the extremism of the offer was appealing as well. His students, if they were any mark of his tutelage, were imposing enough, and different as they all were, they shared a certain coolness, a cruel manner charm which was not modern in the least, but had a strange cold breath of the ancient world. They were magnificent creatures, such eyes, such hands, such looks. Sic oculos. Sic ilk manis, sic arafurabat. I envied them, and found them attractive. Moreover, this strange quality, far from being natural, gave every indication of having been intensely cultivated. It was the same I would come to find with Julian, though he gave quite the opposite impression of freshness and candor. It was not spontaneity, but superior art which made it seem unstudied. Studied or not, I wanted to be like them. It was heady to think that these qualities were acquired once, and that, perhaps, this was the way I might learn them. This was all a long way from piano, and my father's gas station. And if I do take classes with you, will they all be in Greek? I asked him. He laughed. Of course not. 
We'll be studying Dante, Virgil, all sorts of things. But I wouldn't advise you to go all out and buy a copy of Goodbye, Columbus, required notoriously in one of the freshman English classes, if you will forgive me for being vulgar. George's Lafargu was disturbed when I told him what I planned to do. This is a serious business, he said. You understand, don't you, how limited will be your contact with the rest of the faculty and with the school? He's a good teacher, I said. No teacher is that good, and if you should by chance have any disagreements with him or be treated unjustly in any way, there will be nothing anyone on the faculty can do for you. Pardon me, but I do not see the point of paying a $30,000 tuition simply to study with one instructor. I thought of referring that question to the Hampton College Endowment Fund, but I said nothing. He leaned back in his chair. Forgive me, but I should think that the elitic values of such a man would be repugnant to you, he said. Frankly, this is the first time I have ever heard of his accepting a pupil who is on such considerable financial aid. Being a democratic institution, Hampton College is not founded on such principles. Well, he can't be all that elitist if he accepted me, I said. He didn't catch my sarcasm. I am willing to speculate that he isn't aware of your assistance, he said seriously. Well, if he doesn't know, I said, I'm not going to tell him.